and gone the last couple of weeks, we're going through a series called How to Live a Best Seller. And I'll summarize it really quickly. In every good book or good movie, there's always a main character. That main character always runs into a problem. Through that problem, he always or she always finds a guide, and that guide always brings them a plan. If you go to a good movie, uh, you can kind of formulate what's going to happen because you follow the formula. And honestly, almost every movie that's ever been made follows this formula. And so the thought is, well, what's the plan? When I go to a movie with my wife, I'll sit down and we'll watch it, and within two to three minutes, you're always like, who's going to die? My wife always says, that person's going to die. And I always, it ruins it for me when she's always constantly pointing out, here's what's going to happen. That person has a problem. That person's going to die. Let's just walk out. I like to enjoy the movie. I like to be still and experience it. The question, though, that comes through that is, what's the plan? Like, what's the plan? Today, we're looking at what is the plan? If you or I are the character and life brings us problems and we are seeking out a guide, which for me is found here, and I, I seek out then, then this question of, What's the plan? But see, here's what I've experienced in my life. When I ask that question, what's the plan? So often I say, well, here's the plan. Here's, here's what I can do. Here's how I can get out of this. Or I'll sit down and I'll make out a plan for my life. I'm not a guy that likes details. I'm not a person that likes to come up with an extreme detailed plan. I just kind of like to go, all right, let's go. What's going to happen? But what happens in my life as I've looked back, when I've asked that question to myself, what's the plan? And I've sat down and I've really tried to put it out in details of here's what I want to do and here's why and here's the things I want to achieve and here's why. What I've realized is too often those become me-centered. And so when we look at this question today, what's the plan? The question is, is it me-centered or not? I'll explain it to you. For example, when I think back of all the plans and all the things that I've done in my life, there's one story in particular that is hands down the dumbest plan that I've ever come up with. My wife said, you shouldn't share this story. And I said, they need to understand who I am as a person and where I'm coming from. When I was in college, I went to college at a conservative Christian college called George Fox in Oregon. And I went there on a track scholarship. I didn't know anything about the school. All I know is they paid me money to run. And that's really all I cared about. My freshman year, I broke my back. Uh, in track in a race, and so I lost my track scholarship. Not my fault, it just broke. Sometimes your back breaks and you go on with life. Because of that, I couldn't run anymore, and so they took away my scholarship, which I felt was their fault, not my fault. Sometimes backs break. My sophomore year, I started really trying to come up with a plan because I'd lost my way to pay for college. So I began to process a plan. And I remember... I used to go to the financial aid department because in order to formulate a good plan, you got to have a good amount of knowledge behind said plan. So every day I'd go to the financial aid packet, the financial aid office. I got to know the people by name. I saw when they came, when they left, where they sat, whose desk was whose. I was just, I mean, I just wanted to formulate a plan. In reality, I was casing the joint. And, and one night I was on a walk. It was, I don't know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. And I was walking around the building numerous times, just just checking doors, making sure it's locked. I'm just, and, and there was one door I, I realized that every night when I pushed it in hard, it popped open. So I decided to explore what was inside the financial aid office at night. And I noticed in one of the doors, above the door, there's a window. It's an old, old building, you know, when they used to have the ventilation window above the door. Uh, and so I realized a person could fit through that window. A couple of days later, around 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up. And I thought, let's go exploring the financial aid office. I'd formulated my plan. I was ready to, to, to get, enter into, let's call it this next phase in my life. So I went to the door. I popped the door open. <laughs> Some people looking at me like, how is this guy on stage even speaking? Like, <laughs> it was you. I saw you. Um, went into the building, closed the door, stood before the door, realized, you know, I'm a rock climber, I can get up there, climbed up, made my way into the office, stood in the office, walked over to the computers, 1988, 1989, back when they used to put their passwords, in every morning at nine, I noticed this, coincidentally, <laughs> sat down, put the passwords in the computer, the entire financial record for the entire school came up on the computer. And I sat there, and it was as if I wanted to go, you get a scholarship, and you get a scholarship, and you get a scholarship, because you're charging too much money, so you get a scholarship. 
And I've really honestly fully justified every single one of my actions as I sat there. They earn it, they owe it to me. It's not my fault. It's not my, I can't control this. This is a good plan. I sat there and I pulled up my name, typed in Paul Gunther Jr. Financial aid package comes up. And I see all these zeros. And so then I pulled one up and I put $10,000 academic scholarship. That person knows me. (laughs) And I sat there and I thought, is this really a good plan? And I thought to myself, like there's, there's several different things here going on. First of all, I'll probably get expelled if I get caught. Like a good mother. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Potentially, I'll go to jail. But most importantly, guaranteed, my girlfriend's going to dump me. (laughs) And then the thing that kind of sealed it, I sat there and I looked at it, and it says $10,000. Okay, I can buy that. Academic scholarship. There's no one on this entire campus that's going to believe that Paul Gunther Jr. could qualify for an academic scholarship. And I'm like, this, pay, this plan is bound to fail. And then I really, I asked the question, God, is this, like, now what? Like, what? And I, I remember having this moment. I honestly sat there for a solid hour just staring at this blinking screen and asking the question, God, now what? And I was trying to justify it from every single angle I could. And I finally hit delete, closed it up, turned off the computer, climbed out the window, went out the door, locked it, went back to my room. A couple days later, I'm working at the physical plant, and I said to them, hey, guys, I noticed there's a loose door over here. You might want to fix that, or somebody's going to rob this joint. I'm just saying. I've just noticed. But I laid laid in bed for weeks thinking, okay, now what? Like, my plans are obviously not very well planned out. It's not honoring to God. Now what? Now, a side story. My dad let me use his car that year, and I was able to sell it to one of my professors and pay for my schooling. So it worked out anyway. He wasn't very happy. but. And so you have these things in your life that you can look back and you can ask the question of, now what? Like, what's the plan? Like, that clearly wasn't thought out. It clearly wasn't honoring God. But even sometimes when we're trying to honor God with our lives, when we're trying to live the way he wants us to, we have to ask those questions of, okay, now what? As we look at this question, what's the plan, and the bigger question of how to live a bestseller, uh, we've been also studying the life of Moses and looking at the books of Exodus, and we're going to be in chapters 19 and 20 today. But to quickly summarize all of that, because I think that Moses was also asking the questions, now what? Now, to quickly recap Moses, he was born an Israelite in Egypt. He was raised in Pharaoh's house by the princess. So he was raised, in a sense, with royalty, with wealth. When he became of age, he noticed that his people, the Israelites, were constantly persecuted. And one day he became mad and killed one of the Egyptians. And so then not only did the Israelites turn on him, but the Israelites, but the Egyptians turned on him. So Moses leaves. He runs out into the desert. In a sense, he says, I'm leaving all this behind and I'm starting new. He finds a wife. He has a new life. And for 40 years, he's just existing out here in the desert. It says that one day he was with his flocks and he was before Mount Sinai. And as he's standing there before Mount Sinai, he noticed a bush that's on fire. So he walks to the bush as you do. And God begins to speak to him. And he says, you've been living over here for too long. I need you to return to Egypt. I need you to rescue my people. So Moses has an argument with God on why he's flawed, why he can't, why he's not good enough. He has all these excuses. And every time, it's as if he's saying, God, now what? This plan that you're saying will never work. And God is saying, I need you to go back to where you don't want to go. So Moses leaves the base of Mount Sinai, walks back to Egypt. Long story short, frees the people. Aaron comes with him, his brother, helps him communicate. All of the Israelites then follow Moses out of Egypt. And as soon as they leave, they're pursued by the Egyptians. And all of the Israelites begin to yell at Moses, now what? What's the plan? So Moses raises his hands, and God tells him to, the Red Sea parts 
the Israelites cross. You now look at it and it's like now we're rescued. But it's as if this cycle keeps happening over and over and because the Israelites get thirsty now. And they begin to yell at Moses and they begin to say, it was better off in captivity because at least we had food and water. You know, we have a tendency to constantly look back and go, yeah, remember there, that was a better place. In reality, we're called to continue to move this direction, to continue to move forward. So God shows Moses how to bring water from a rock and he brings them to the base of Mount Sinai. And we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. Moses is, in a sense, now come full circle. Keep in mind, his story started in Mount Sinai. He's gone all the way back to Egypt. He's taken the people. He's rescued them. He's brought them back. And now all of them are in Mount Sinai again. And it says, on the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. And after they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Now when you read stories, or you, you need to picture them. So you need to picture them back in the exact place where they've started. I don't know if you've ever lived through a chapter in your life, or through a series of events where you feel like you finally kind of made it to that place where, man, I am glad that is behind me. When you get years down the road and you realize, man, I was only at the beginning, at the very beginning of the story, and yet I thought it was finished. You see, Moses has got to be standing there because he's come full circle and he's back and he's before the place where it started and he says, okay, we're at the finish line. You see, we begin to make our plans when we ask that question, what's the plan? About a year and a half ago, I began to feel that I was ready for a sabbatical. Not that I didn't love all of you. I just needed some me time. Don't, you're fine. And so I started writing out a plan for what I was going to do on my sabbatical. One of the things that I wrote down was get a knife and a flint and a fishing hook and a tarp. And I was going to go into the woods that way until I became lost. And then I was going to see if I got rescued. Really wrote this down. This is my agenda. Uh, I was going to go into countries, I wanted to go to three countries where you weren't really allowed to go to. Didn't matter which one, just any of them, pick one, I'll go in it. And I wanted to have like two, three months of just adventure. And I was getting so excited and I started making plans of when to ask for the sabbatical and started kind of mapping it out, here's what I'm going to do. And then we came back from Malawi last year with my family and as many of you know, my wife was diagnosed three days later with cancer. And we began to go down that journey that was never even on the agenda. Like, that wasn't even something I'd ever even thought of. And so as we started going down that path, I realized I need to take a sabbatical just to be with my wife. And so I took six weeks off, and here's what I did. I sat next to her on the couch. I followed her everywhere she went. I stayed at home, and I never left unless she left. And for six weeks, I sat there. And I can honestly now look back and go, that was the greatest sabbatical I've ever taken. None of my plans or agenda were accomplished, but I was able to sit and be still. You see, when Moses is sitting here, when he's standing before the mountain, when they're camping there, this question that he's been asking of, now what? Now what do we do? I've returned full circle. I've come back to where we started. I'm now at the end of this journey Now what? So then it says in verse 3, it says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. You see, this question of now what begins to have a little bit of clarity. God isn't telling him exactly what's going to happen, but he's giving them some clarity on this now what questions. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant. It goes on in verse 7 and it says this. You see, sometimes we want the full answer. We want it right away, but It's little by little, it's step by step, it's moment by moment that you're constantly walking into God's presence and saying, now what? It says in verse 7, so Moses 
went back, he summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people have said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So the now what question now is coming super clear to Moses. But taking a sidestep in this, when you read something like this, you're going along, you're tracking, and then God says, have them wash their clothes. Have them do their laundry first before they come before me. Like, why is that there? Oftentimes when we read scripture, we see something and we ask, that's weird, and then we just move on. But if I'm asking the bigger question, what's the plan? Then I have to know the teachings, the, the, the things that bring me closer to God. And if I don't take my time to study it and learn it, I can't appropriately step into these next journeys and to these next places where God is leading me. You see, when you look at this statement, have them wash their clothes, it's a massive statement if you step back and understand it. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve have betrayed God. They've eaten the fruit that they weren't supposed to. When God finally restores them, it says that he came, he sat down, and he made them clothes. Uh, when Jacob left uh, and went away and was gone for years and years, when he was finally coming back to his brother, he was afraid that his brother was going to kill him because all the stuff that he did to him. As they stood there on the river, getting ready to cross back in, to enter back into a relationship with his family, he turned around and he talked to all of his family and everyone that's traveling with them, and he said to all of them, go and wash your clothes. Put on new clothes. When Joseph was in jail, right before he's called back to be with Pharaoh, it says that Joseph went and washed himself and put on new clothes. You see the statement over and over and over again in Scripture. What it really means is prepare your heart. You see, because you're about to be called on a new adventure, on a new journey, God is about to ask you to do something new. And if your heart isn't prepared for that step, you're going to miss the teachings. You're going to miss the blessings. You're going to miss the calling. You see, oftentimes we sit back and we just wait for God to do something. In reality, he's saying, prepare your heart. Be constantly ready to go. There's a new journey that's just around the corner. And you may think you're at the end of this journey, but you're really just at the beginning. Prepare your heart. When I lived in Guatemala, uh, my pastor there moved to India. And right before he left and moved to India, he gave away everything. I mean everything. He left the country with pictures and memories. And I asked him, I'm like, why are you giving everything away? He says, here's the thing. When I leave something with someone, they will for the rest of their life think of me every time that they look at that. And the bigger story is, is every time they do that, they'll pray for me. He goes, I want to leave this place knowing that there is an army of people that are praying for me as I turn around and go on this new adventure that God is calling me on. He goes, but the bigger statement is, I'm allowed to start completely fresh and completely new. And every time he said, I go into a new place, I'm, I'm hands wide open because I've got nothing and I'm completely starting over and I'm allowed to have God bless me in those moments and to see how he moves and how he leads me on this next journey. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 16, it says this. They've washed their clothes. They've done their laundry. They're ready. It says, On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp was trembling then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered. 
You see, the question, what's the plan? With the comment of, now what? Has now simply become, now. They've been told to prepare their hearts. They've been told to be ready. They've been told, here's what's coming next. Well, now is the moment. And what happens when we're not paying attention to what God is doing in our life is sometimes we miss the now moments because we're so focused on the now what comments that we're constantly throwing. But God sits here and and right here he says, now. You see, what happens then is God then gives them the Ten Commandments. Whether you know who God is or not, most of us have heard some of these. And so God spells these out to all of them, and he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's interesting that those four are above the line there, because those four are Godward. They're how we're supposed to be in relationship to God. The last six that he gives is honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. Those are man words. That's how we're to react and be in interaction with each other. But ultimately, it's how we're to relate to God. And I read a statement this last week that said, how we relate to God determines how we relate to others. You see, what happens is God gives the Ten Commandments. And then from that, all of Scripture is birthed. And we're given this this amazing plan and guidebook that says, here's what I'm calling you to do. So this now moment is they're standing there, and God is giving this to them. But as I've struggled through many of my plans and many of my issues and many of my agendas, what I've realized is the question that I've constantly been asking is that statement, now what? And I've been, I wrote it on my wall, and I've, I've just been processing that statement, now what? And I realized if I'm going to truly fall into this, this teaching, this now moment, the Ten Commandments, the, the everything that God is giving us, I've been looking at it wrong, so I switched it. And instead of now what, it became what now? So then I started asking the question, what now? And every time I ask if I'm directing that question towards God, which is hard because sometimes I don't get the answer I want or I don't get anything, but I still need to ask the question, what now? And without thinking, I started asking the question like this, what now? In the midst of this cancer journey, what now? In the midst of these struggles, what now? In the midst of my insecurities, what now? In the midst of God, what are you calling me to do? What now? And then it went from being a me-centered plan to with my hand placed out to a he-centered plan. The question became, what is he calling me to do? What is he asking me to do? How is he asking me to live? How is he calling me to communicate with these people? How is he calling me to to make decisions? And then at the end of every day or every conversation, I then have to go, man, I, I failed on that one. I need to do better on that tomorrow. It's he centered. And that question is, what now? At the end of this, it's interesting. And at the end of chapter 20, in verse 18, it says, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard his trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. And they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But, we, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. There's two places in this story. There's a good story where the people were before God, but it says that they remained at a distance. There's only so much that can happen when you're you're far away from something. And they chose to stay there. And what I've realized in my areas, in my life, in my struggles, when I've, when I've questioned God, when I felt like it wasn't going the way it should be, I've realized that I'm standing way back here at a distance. It says the people remained at, di- at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was with his hand out, with this question of, what now? What now? Do I want to live out a good story 
which I can go through life, and at some point when I die, it's a, it's a good story. I did the things I was supposed to, or I can lean in, and I can press hard, and I can constantly be asking the question, what now, and I can live a great story. It doesn't have clarity sometimes. It doesn't make sense sometimes, but it's powerful. You know, there's a good movie you can go to. There's probably 20 good movies. You can go see The Avengers. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I haven't seen it. Someone's going to die. Someone's going to blow up. Something bad's going to happen. And then everyone's rescued in the end. I just saved you like 10 bucks. Or you can go see a great movie. I saw a movie this last week called uh, A Quiet Place. Don't take your kids. Like, it's rated PG-13, so it's pastor approved. I can talk about it. But I went into the movie, like, I knew it was, like, set in a quiet place. That's really all I knew. And within five minutes, I'm sitting there, and the movie's really quiet, just saying, like, really, don't take your kids. (laughs) But I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa! Like, face peeled back, scared out of my mind, didn't see that coming. And it's quiet, and so I yelled in the movie, which doesn't happen often. And when I left the movie, five or ten minutes before the ending, that's all I'm going to say, I was like, what? Like, are you kidding me? And for two days, I, I walked, and I'm like, I, just, I really can't believe that happened. Well, I mean, it didn't really happen in real life, but I feel like, like I felt like I was drawn so into the movie that I kind of walked out like, And it's a phenomenal, great movie because it wasn't what I was expecting. You know, here's the thing with life. There will be choices. There will be moments. There will be things that happened. And you have to choose, is this going to be a me-centered story or a he-centered story? The greatest blessing in my last year has been to follow my wife to cancer treatment, to chemo, to doctor's appointments, to walk in behind her and be invisible and watch her interact with people and watch how she goes through this story and lives through this struggle. On Wednesday was her last radiation treatment. Um, And so with the chemo, I would go and I'd I'd go with her because it's three, four hours and I'd sit and we'd we'd just be there. But for radiation, you go in, it's really quick. It's not something I could really go with, with her. On the last treatment, I jumped in the car, and I said, I'm going with you. And she started to cry, and she said, I thought I was going to have to do this last day by myself. And I said, I, I didn't steal the 10000 Like, I'm a good guy. Like, <laughs> deep down, I'm still here. I didn't go to jail. Sometimes we're given grace. And so I walked in behind her, and as I'm walking in, the front desk, every single person there says her name. Melinda, how are you doing? So she brings out her bag and she gives each one of them a cinnamon roll that she made. And then as we go back, there's patients, every single patient she greets by name. There's one lady that was crying, so she sat down and sat with her for a minute. Here, here's a cinnamon roll. Cancer will be gone soon, hopefully. Uh, And then uh, the doctors and the nurses came out and they said, Melinda, can we take a picture with you? And I'm just kind of sitting there, and they said, Paul, and I'm like, oh, yeah, and they're like, could you take the picture? I'm like, yeah, it's it's cool. (laughs) Captain Invisible, which was the greatest thing ever. And then as we're getting ready to leave, she's signing up, and she's getting ready for her next, her last follow-up appointment in like a month, and one of the chemo nurses came around and yelled her name and started crying and said, I was so hoping to see you today. She gave her this hug, and she says, thank you so much for coming in. It's like she said, thank you for having cancer and blessing my life. Like, it's as backwards as you can get. So Melinda hugged her and invited her to a party we're having, and she then just said, it's as if I watched her go through life. What now? How can he be the center of this horrible experience? What now? And it changes how you live. It changes how you process. Instead of focusing on all the garbage and the junk, you get to focus on all the blessings and the story. You get to focus on the grace and the healing. You get to focus on the beauty and the hope. In reality, 
I could be asking the question, now what? Like, now what do we have to go through? Now what does my wife have to deal with? Or just placing that hand out and asking the question, what now? God, how can you use me as a blessing through this next journey? What now? God, allow me to speak the words you want. What now? God, bring peace into my house. I don't know how that's ever going to happen, but what now? My grandmother used to say 50 times a day, she used to constantly say, Lord willing, Lord willing, tomorrow we'll go out for pizza. Lord willing, tomorrow the Smiths are going to come over. Lord willing, this will happen. Lord willing, we'll return to Thailand, which they never did. Lord willing, my husband will be healed from a sickness, which he never was. Lord willing, we'll be called back into ministry, which they never were. Lord willing, this will happen. The Lord willing statement becomes the statement of, I am leaning into where God is, and I'm trusting him with my what now. And I'm able to walk forward through those moments of confusion, of doubt, of struggle with my hand out. It says, God, allow me to live my life centered around you. What now? 